Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 235, featuring the third installment of my interview with Miss Brenda Romero. In this part of the interview, we talk about Dungeons & Dragons Heroes before getting into a game that it sounds like Brenda would like to forget about, namely Playboy the Mansion. We also talk about what it's like to be pregnant with twins at a game studio. A lot of great stuff in this episode, so without further ado, here is Miss Brenda Romero. So at some point around this time, I guess, she was the lead designer on a game called Dungeons & Dragons Heroes, mm -hmm. a hack and slash game for the, uh, the Xbox. Can you talk a little bit about that transition? Yeah, you know, that was a, that was a, a it doesn't seem in theory like a big step, but it was. Um, you know, I, I will often advise people that if you're transitioning, uh, if you're going from one role to another in the industry to do a plus one jump. So if you are a designer on an RPG, a hardcore RPG on a PC, it is reasonable to eventually become lead designer on a hardcore RPG on a PC. And that's a plus one jump. So moving to Heroes, I was moving to new console. I'd never worked on a console game before. Uh, this was an action adventure, even though it was called D&D. And it, so it was really different. And I was, you know, and I was going to be lead. So, okay, I've been lead before, but I hadn't you know, hadn't worked on an action adventure game, hack and slash, you know, basically gauntlet style game on a console. And, and not only that, man, we were, it wasn't just that it was on a console. It was on a console and we had a really short dev cycle and we were trying to ship on, on three different consoles. So, so the Xbox, PS2, and um, the GameCube at the time, which is just nuts, right? It's just crazy um, that we were trying to do all of that. So there was... Uh, you know, there was, there was a period of, of adjustment for sure. And then the game that we were originally making, um, you know, just as an aside to that, I, I think people, when they're, when they're just players of games, they, when they're just players of games, thank goodness there are players of games. I, I don't mean to sound like, like I'm dismissing that because I am just a player of FTL, like a fairly ridiculous level player of FTL. Um, so when people are, are playing games and they're not behind the lines, they, they often don't see what, what craziness can happen, right? So it's really easy to critique a game like, oh man, I would have done this. Well, no, you know what? You would have done exactly what I did if you were in my shoes because that was all that could be done. So, so Dungeons and Dragons Heroes started out with, with an interesting mandate and its mandate from higher, high above, higher than anybody else in the company was this, that there will be no NPCs uh, there will be no leveling, there will be no upgrading of weapons, there's no economy, no quests, uh, no store. Um, so basically everything, no character advancement, if I didn't already say that. So basically everything that makes D&D a D&D, &D, it's not going to be there. You're just, you're going to just start the game and you're just going to bash your way to the end. Um, and not change your weapon the whole way. And so three months before launch, uh, and, and I, you know, I don't think anybody that was in the actual development team really bought into that. And everybody, you know, that might work fine, like in an arcade case where you're playing, you know, your play time is 20 minutes or whatever, 20 minutes if you're amazing. But in a game, in a D and D game, you players have expectations. I'm going to come in. I'm going to create a character. My character is going to level up. My character is going to find cool shit in the dungeon and my character is going to become a badass by the end of the game. Um, and I'm going to do this by meeting NPCs and trading with them and finding amazing loot and combat and, um, and solving quests and going to the store and trading stuff in. So, so three months to launch, uh, we had a meeting where I, I still remember this one programmer. He was a great coder, but he, he never said a lot. He was really quiet. And, and he, in this meeting, like we, we knew like, We've got to change this game. This game, the, the game as you that you've asked us to design, which we have right here, is not fun. And it's not what people think of D D is. I mean, it's fun until you're like, okay, my I, I feel like I've I want a new weapon. I want to do something other than just beat the shit out of stuff from beginning to end. Um and so I mean that might work great in a multiplayer game. Uh, it might work great in a game where it's player versus player and that player, uh, the interest that you have, because that player keeps changing, but but this was 
quite another matter. So I just remember him saying something like, you know, you know, Brenda's is right. We need to we need to change this game. And so with three months to go, the most Herculean development task I have ever seen happened. And I remember like I remember on my list from the producer, there was this like item list time three days. And so I had three days to create a list of 1000 items. Right. And, um, and it was, and it was, uh, which, you know, now in, in hindsight, there, there are pretty easy ways to do that. And I could have done it in a day, uh, you know, with, with Excel, uh, and I used Excel, but there were easier ways that I could have done it, but you know, that's experience. Right. But anyway, we basically, we slammed an economy in there. We slammed an item list. We slammed leveling. We slammed uh, you know, level curve, experience curves, um, um, uh, economy curves. We put quests in the game. And like, you think about it, we've got already built levels and we have to slam quests into our already built levels. So we basically, into, into an existing RPG, whatever, I don't know if you'd call it an RPG, into whatever it was, we slammed all of this stuff with three months to go. Like basically at alpha, we... We slammed it all in there. And the result was a game that, in hindsight, it's probably too easy. You know, it's just like it's not balanced right. Um, but I look back on that game and I think, like, holy shit, how do we do that in three months? Um, and launched it. So, so, you know, that's the stuff that people wouldn't see behind the scenes, <laughs> if they weren't behind the scenes, rather. But, uh, you know, I, I, remember, I remember that pretty vividly. And... And at the time, too, that office of Atari, um, they were closing it down. Like, I remember you know, people just weren't getting their business cards, and then they stopped refilling the soda machines, and, and people were touring through the offices, and, and employees were told, like, oh, no, no, they're just renting out the other half, <laughs> the other half of the building. Don't worry about that. And I remember thinking, no, you know what? I'm worried about that. So, so you know, so the interviews for me and some other people off of off site uh, with other companies had already begun. The signs, the signs were not on the wall, but they were walking through the walls. Um, so, yeah, that was an interesting project. Now, speaking of interesting projects, I think we're up now to the uh, your time at Cyberlore. Yeah, <laughs> we're working on a game called Playboy the Mansion, uh, 2005. You're playing a uh, Hugh Hefner. Uh, I guess you describe this quite kind of as a sim. I saw it described as an R-rated Sims 2. I mean, you think that's a pretty accurate analogy? Ah, uh, you know, interestingly enough, I sort of feel like uh, Playboy plays more like an adventure game than it does than it does a Sim. But yeah, yeah, it was. Um, you know, it's interesting because periodically, you know, I, I take uh, I take stances on things in the industry, and somebody will unearth the fact that I worked on Playboy, and they and they wield it. They wield it like a blade Cuisinart, you know, like, ha ha, look what you did, you crazy hypocrite, you know, and I think like, oh, God, you know, I, I don't know that if I had an opportunity, if that opportunity came up again, that I would be interested well, in. How exactly did the opportunity come up? Uh, there was a job in, um, there was a job, they were looking for a game designer, in fact, at the time, the IP was, I didn't even know what I was, what the IP was. Um, when I interviewed there, even like I, I did the interview on the phone and then I went there and I still had no idea what the IP was. I found out what the IP was only when I got there. And it was, it was fascinating to me, right? Like, you know, geez, I've never worked on a game like this. This seems really interesting. It was super nice and the town was really beautiful. Um, and I was taking over uh, from another, like I didn't actually, uh, I wasn't the starting lead designer on the project. The project was actually already underway when I took over and it was a, a magazine publishing sim. And you know, that's, it's one of the great, the great exercises in game design is like, what is, what is the player fantasy? What is the player thinking about? If I say, all right, you're going to play, um, you're going to be Hugh Hefner. Well, there's, there's about 300 things that go through the average mind of the average guy, none of which include, I'm going to be running a magazine empire. Yes. Like, That's thinking more like just one thing would run through your mind. <laughs> right, okay. Well, maybe one thing in 300 varieties of one thing, right? But, uh, but anyway, so the direction that had been chosen uh, was a magazine running empire. And, and, you know, for better or worse, that's what it was. Um, you, you know, I, I, in, you know, in retrospect, I don't think that, you know, that's not a game that I would have, you know, nowadays, I, I don't think I would work on a game like that. 
Um, I don't think I'd be comfortable working on a game like that. But at the time, you know, it, it seemed really interesting to me. You know, like I was aware of, I was aware of a lot more of Hugh Hefner's, um, just because I'm a game designer and I study random shit all the time. You know, I was aware of uh, a lot of the work that he'd done in music because my brother is a professional musician. So, you know, the Playboy Jazz Fest Festival and stuff. Um, and other things like, you know, Fahrenheit 451 was first published in Playboy, um, you know, and, and, you know, there really were a lot of great interviews and articles. Yeah, it's not like we're talking about Hustler or Penthouse, right? Yeah, you know, but, it, but you know, I think for many people, um, not I think, I know for many people, there's not a whole lot of difference, right? Um, you know, one is certainly showing more than the other, uh, and one has, um, one is much more sexualized than the other. But but still, you know, it's, it's, um, it, Playboy is displaying women for the purposes of ornamentation um, and, and is earning its money off of that, you know? So, so I don't know if I would have, you know, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't accept the job today, but back then it seemed really interesting to me and very intellectually interesting to me. Um, and it seemed like a great opportunity to work with a bunch of good people in, uh, in a beautiful town. And so, so I took it, um, you know, and we, and, and while I think the game, you know, while the, the game, the game certainly, you know, I, I don't think anybody would call Playboy a great game. You know, we, there, it, it suffered from some, from some flaws, uh, you know, again, and, and I also don't know many game designers who would ever say like, oh, if I had the opportunity to make that game again, I'd make it exactly like I did. You know, so, so it certainly wasn't my best game, and, but I learned a lot from it. Um, and, uh, you know, and I, I guess... You know, that, that's the one that's bittersweet. Like, I had a good time working on it. I worked with a good team, but I, but I don't think I, I would want to work on an IP like that again. I might have my timelines a little confused here, but weren't you uh, pregnant at the time? <laughs> um, listen, I wasn't I pregnant. Pregnant is an understatement, man. Um, yeah, I was horrifically pregnant with twins. There's just no other way to describe it. I had, I was so pregnant. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, I would still be pregnant. I'm positive uh, because they, I, I was, I was pregnant with twins, and they went to term, which can only be described as something no woman should ever go through. Um, one of them was nearly eight pounds, and the other one was nearly seven pounds. And I, not that this has anything to do with traditional game development, but I get to say it because because I have the mic. Um, but at the end, you know, like how pregnancy pants, you know, the maternity pants, they come in like that and then they go down. So if you're horrifyingly pregnant with twins and you're as big as a car, they don't make pants that are that big, right? So I had to get size, <laughs> size 28 pants from Walmart, which just hung down in the front, like straight. They came off of my unbelievably enormous stomach and they went straight down. And then my friends, my friends, you know, bless their, bless their pointy little heads, man. They would, like, I would come down the street and they would just laugh at me because that was so ridiculous. I was so pregnant. Oh, my God, I was so pregnant. Um, yeah, and I mean, as soon as I, as soon as I had the kids, I was right back working, you know. Like, I mean, the same thing happened. I was also pregnant with Wizardry 8. Um, you know what? I planned, I planned my pregnancies around the ship dates of those games, and in both cases, the baby shipped first. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I was horrifyingly pregnant. I would never want to have twins again. I love my twins, but man, carrying twins to term and they and I still, you know, like I said, if if they hadn't if if the delivery hadn't have been a planned delivery um, by C section, man, I would I'm sure I'd still be pregnant. I and I would be I would be bigger than the state of California. It felt like it was never gonna end. You know, we would have playmates periodically. Playmates would come into the office. <laughs> so here's this here's this ungodly pregnant woman and I mean you've everybody has seen probably everybody has seen it, what a woman looks like when she's nine months pregnant and she's kind of waddling and you know there's just it's just like he'll here comes the pregnancy but man seeing a woman who's nine months pregnant with two full-size babies you know there's nothing like that that was <laughs> it's just horrifying and, and then there's like these 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 playmates going around the office you know but oh well, oh well, I can still move, so uh, so I won. You know, that's I guess that's all that matters. 
Well, one good thing that came out of this was your book, right? You were able to collect your thoughts about uh, sex and video games into a book. Yeah. Yeah, I, um, nobody, you know, nobody had done anything like that before. In fact, whenever I start on a game, no matter what the game is, um, I do research on what's already been done because what's the point in, in making the same thing? And so even though Playboy had already started rolling before I got there, uh, I was doing all this research and, and found it really hard to find that sort of stuff. Like you could, you could find, um, you could find all kinds of stuff on RPGs and simulation games, but man, tycoon games, that sort of stuff. But trying to find stuff on what had been done in, in, in sexual content in video games, not just, not just sex in video games, but everything from, uh, you know, intimacy, the full range, you know, the full range from, um, these characters are, falling in love, like all that sort of stuff had never really been explored academically or, or even casually. Um, so, so, I, so I just kept this huge no file as I do. I mean, no matter what game I've worked on, you know, right now I'm working on a Trail of Tears game and I just, there's this massive file that I have of, of all kinds of stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, and so, so eventually those notes um, turned into a book, which was just sort of my collected the collected things and the, the collected things that I, that I learned about it. And, you know, it turns out that the book, um, <laughs> the book isn't really this titillating tell all, right. Uh, um, although I did hear a lot of that sort of stuff, uh, interestingly enough, but um, the book is really just very academic, you know, here, here are the things that have been done in sex and games. Um, but yeah, when I was working on the book though, I heard all kinds of, all kinds of, which I'm not sharing a damn one of them, so don't even ask. But I heard all kinds of, yeah, well, did you know during this period of time at this company that this crazy stuff happened? You know, and I still sometimes, you know, sometimes still hear about that. People are like, oh, you wrote, you wrote that book. Um, but with my name changing to Romero, sometimes people don't necessarily make like, oh, you're the one who wrote that book? So sometimes people don't necessarily make the connection. So you wouldn't describe yourself as an advocate uh, for putting sex into games? Well, I mean, you know, I'm not an advocate of, of, of putting, you know, shield pro fire in the games either, right? Like, it's a quite, or, or, you know, I don't think there's somebody who's, no, right? Because I think that would be utterly ludicrous to do that. Like, let's just change the medium. Am I an advocate for putting sex into movies? Well, no. Like, does it belong there? Right? I mean, so the question is, is, is if, if, your game, if your game involves romantic relationships between characters, okay, well, you know, then, then does it belong there? Will your audience appreciate it? Is this something that, that actually makes the core of the game stronger? In fact, let me just scrap what I said right there. Like, the question is, is what is the core of your game? Does whatever, and I don't care what it is, does... Um, <laughs> whatever it is, does that make the core of your game stronger? If yes, then use it. If no, then don't do it. And it's just, it's really, it's really separate like that. Trying to put sex into games has, has consistently shown that it will not help your game. Sex, in fact, it does not sell <laughs> in games. And maybe it's just because nobody wants to take sex advice from a game developer, and that's a wise choice, <laughs> you know? But no, I, you know, I'm not an advocate of doing that. I, I do think that, um, I do think that we, just in terms of storytelling potential, that, uh, you know, we've got a long ways to go um, compared to other mediums in terms of developing relationships between characters. Uh, you know, but, but the greatest works of art, um, the greatest works of art in movies and in books, um, you know, the, the things that we think are just profound and beautiful, you know, those... Nobody was like, well, geez, you know, can you find some way to get put sex in there? You know, and I and I do understand that that in you know blockbuster movies, maybe that is an actual consideration. Like, geez, can we get some screen time for some stuff? <laughs> but no, of course not. You know, it's what makes the core of the game stronger. Um, yeah, no, that doesn't even occur to me. In fact, it's it's almost universally a bad idea. I know you're an advocate too of, uh, or you are an advocate that is of. Uh, these sort of rating systems and letting parents, I guess, know what, what's in the game and that sort of thing. Uh, so how would you compare that uh, to something like the comics code? I mean, do you think the games should be, you know, it's okay, I guess, that there's a few fringe games out there, but they should be kids-friendly, 
or should uh, anything be available to the game designer? Well, yeah. So I, I, you know, I think this is very similar to the comics code, and you know, I think it's very similar to what happened in movies before then. We are the new medium, and therefore, as the new medium, uh, we will have fingers pointed at us. You know, when something when something happens, when when something tragic happens, I, you know, it's almost like wait for it, wait for it, and he played video games. You know, like it. And when I was growing up, it was wait for it, wait for it. Oh my God, he listened to Black Sabbath. It's Ozzy Osbourne and that crazy. You know, and now like you think about. You know, Ozzy, you know, Ozzy has like a, a reality show, right? Um, you know, but when I was growing up, it was D&D, which I played. So, uh, you know, God knows how I even survived. And I loved Sabbath and Ozzy Osbourne. I mean, we just this past summer went to see Sabbath. And I would have done it again if I had known that, that they were playing in L.A. before all the tickets that we would have wanted sold out. Um, so so it's, it's very similar. We are the new medium. And there's absolutely no reason in the world world that I should be restricted to making games just for kids. Like that's ludicrous. Nobody makes paintings for kids. Well, okay. Nobody makes paintings just for kids. Um, uh, uh, I, f I feel like I'm, I'm not saying that right. I'm sure people actually do make paintings just for kids. What I'm saying is, is they have the full range of human experience when they want to make something. Um, and, you know, like the games that I'm working on now, the non-digital games, these are about some of the most horrific things that have happened. Right. Um, you know, and in fact, uh, you know, my nine year olds still don't really know uh, what train is about. I mean, eventually they'll get there. They're, you know, they're they're, And I, and I won't say it, you know, just for people uh, who may not know. Uh, but but, you know, they're just finding out um, what what the games that I'm making currently are about. You know, they know I make they know I make games about history. But the notion that I would have to restrict um, I would have to restrict my creation to this space that's only consumable by kids. So fuck that. There's there's no way I'm going to do that. That's ridiculous. No way. I mean, there are some there are some countries where uh, you know Australia still has a refused classification where if your game isn't playable by 18 and under, um, you know you you can't you your game gets refused classification, and, and you know that's that's that'll go away, right? Like. You know, John and I were recently asked to speak um, at this event uh, where you know, basically it's a monthly dinner thing at this at this uh, museum, the science center, and uh, so people come in and, and they listen to a speaker talk about, and they just bring in experts on something. So, oh, okay, these here are the experts on video games, and um, and so so we come in, um, which I should say we call an expert on video games. I feel like I need to know hell of a lot more than I know to be to be an actual expert. Uh, so an expert on expert on myself, yes. Expert on all video games. Wow, that's 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 a challenge. Um, so they bring us in and we give our talk, but most of the people hadn't even ever played a game. Like they had knowledge of Pong, they had knowledge of Pac-Man, and that was it. Um, and so you know that 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 wave of people, like we are as a society, aging out of. Um, aging out people who have never played a game before, and it's much more common for for you know people who are in their forties today. You know, odds are they played some kind of game. People who are in their thirties, they played some kind of game, and people who are in their twenties, if they haven't played some kind of game, you think like, how did you? <laughs> Come here, let me take care of that for you. <laughs> you know, let me let's fix that because it's everybody plays games. Do you think there's anything about the medium of video games that, you know, the fact that they are interactive that makes something inappropriate in a sexual or violent way uh, more egregious than you would say if you just read about it in a novel or saw it in a movie? Um, I think that some people believe that. I think there is the perception of that. Uh, but no, I don't think so. You know, there's been no studies that have correlated that. Um, in fact, very early on, you know, going back to wizardry, wizardry was actually used by psychologists for people who had difficulty socializing and had difficulty working with other people because uh, the game involved cooperation between six characters in a dungeon. So 
games in their early days, uh, well, even now, were used to people's benefit. Um, you know, they use uh, shooters are are used to treat um, PTSD in uh, in people who have been to war and have war related PTSD. So, I, I I really believe that it's it's just the it's just a question of where we're at now um, in society. You know, we, we're not pointing the finger at, at Black Sabbath and Ozzy Osbourne. And before Black Sabbath and Ozzy Osbourne, we were pointing the finger at um, D&D. Uh, I guess maybe those two cross each other timeline-wise. Um, and before that, we were pointing fingers at uh, the VCR, that the release of the VCR is going to bring porn into everybody's homes. They were right about that one. Um, and before that, there was the comics code, and that was going to do all kinds of horrible things. And movies were going to do all kinds of horrible things. And they even called, like, like the automobile, which now nobody can imagine people protesting the release of the automobile. Um, but people did. Because they, they called them, you know, they called them devil wagons. That the only reason people would need these is so they could leave home and, and go frequent prostitutes. Any new technology is greeted with skepticism. It is. And it's our turn at the bat. And me and a great many game developers are waiting like please new technology can we just become like can we just like please lose our place and be sort of you know ozzy osbourne and black sabbath level um and you know when i look back now like i look back now it's interesting because um avalon so avalon's our nine-year-old and it, this sounds horrible right like avalon's our nine-year-old and she loves doom doom <laughs> you think like doom doom shouldn't be played by a nine-year-old but if you looked at doom lately like Doom is like, you know, like the, the big, the big, you know, cacodemon even comes out and he almost looks cute, right? Like, you know, compared to the stuff that's out there now, like Doom is an almost cute game. But when it came out in, uh, in December 10th, 1993, which coincidentally was the day after Congress had debated violence in video games, like... And the guys that it had, it wasn't like, ha let's save it till that day. That's just when it was done. And they were totally unaware of, of what was happening in Congress the day before, um, obviously, because they were trying to ship a game. But man, what a way for the game industry to just to just nail that coffin. Um, you know, I, I just I just don't feel I don't feel like there's a correlation. And I feel that we will eventually I feel we will eventually outgrow it. You know, video games are an interactive medium and that allows them and that allows them a range of beauty and a depth that no other medium can possess. It's no other medium can possess. In the easiest way right now, the easiest mathematical design that we have is, is in some way I do damage to you. And, and as a result of you, your damage going down, um, uh, you lose and I win, right? I mean, it's, it's effectively chess. How many, if we imagine your pieces on the board as hit points, um, I have to get you down to one piece, uh, one hit point, and then you lose. Um, and if I can get you checked before you check me, you know, this isn't, this isn't a pattern just in, um, it's not a pattern just in video games. It's also a pattern in board games where territorial acquisition, like I will destroy you, like risk. I'm going to destroy all your units. And, you know, people aren't going to Walmart and thinking, or maybe they, I'm probably they have in the past. I shouldn't say they're not. Probably they have in the past gone to Walmart and protested, um, Pro protested that there are violent uh, board games on the shelves. Um, so no, I don't think the interactivity is is so much of an issue, you know, especially, especially, uh, you know, when I think about, uh, well, you know, we don't see headlines that the, the top graduating senior, uh, the top graduating senior of Harvard University uh, played video games. Uh, you know, we don't see stuff like that. You know, we have, as as you can imagine, a hardcore gaming house. Um, and the most hardcore gamer in the house is probably our 13 year old. She's level 90 in WoW. Um, there's pretty much nothing she hasn't played. And again, she made honor roll. Um, and the other kids are again, gonna make honor roll in spite of their, uh, in spite of their, their game playing. You know, we're smart. They've got to do their homework first. Um, but yeah, I, I just don't have the same, I don't have the negative attachments to video games. I, I don't, there, there's no research to uh, corroborate that. But, and, and, and the anti-game 
vocal movement that was very loud in the 90s and early 2000s is not nearly as loud now. And I think in part, it's actually due to the rise in casual games, the rise in games like Bejeweled Blitz, you know, and as much as, as much as people can malign Zynga, I think Zynga had a lot to do with changing attitudes about games. Not, so in game development, you know, there's, there's, there's some, some non-positive thoughts headed in their direction, you know, about, uh, well, about all kinds of things, right? But, um, but I think, you know, Farmville, as a, as a woman in her 40s, I, I didn't, most of my friends that I went to school with had no idea what the hell I did for a living. You're a game designer. What does that mean? Oh, what, I don't even care what it means. Goodbye. You know, I, or you, let's just talk about something else. But for the first time, my, um, my niece, my niece is just six years younger than me. And my niece actually said to me, like, do you play Farmville? It was the first time in a in 20 plus year career she'd ever asked me. And she's not a gamer at all. And people who would formally just declare, I hate video games. They're violent, which isn't really true, right? Like the last time I knew only 8% of games were N-rated. And most games nowadays are not rated, you know, like what, what's the rating on, on an iPhone? What's the rating of a Facebook game? So um, because of the rise in casual games and because of the literally millions of players on Facebook who, who played Farmville and Frontierville and, and all, you know, the blast of games that Zynga came out with, I think that the casual game explosion changed a lot of people's minds about what video games could be, that they weren't just shooters. Um, and I think that's really important going forward. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I should be back next week with a fourth and maybe a fifth or sixth installment with uh, Miss Brenda Romero. Quite a bit of the interview left to go. We haven't even gotten into uh, her thoughts on gender and, uh, and or women in the games industry yet. Uh, we touched on a little bit, but she goes into a lot more depth. And uh, we also need to talk, of course, about her uh, really cool board games and lots of other stuff, so stay tuned for that. Now, as always, I want to thank you guys very, very much uh, for your lovely support of the show. A lot of you guys have been sharing uh, the information about the show on Twitter and on Facebook. You know, I keep an eye on those things, guys. I try to thank you when I can, but if I, if I somehow miss it, uh, still, I hope you'll accept uh, th these thanks. I really do see those, and I appreciate those uh, very much. Also, of course, I want to thank you if you have uh, supported the show monetarily. Uh, you can do that through PayPal. Well, really, though, it's better to use uh, Patreon. You'll find the link to that in the show notes. And uh, just an update, I do have the April... Uh, Patreon supporters only podcast. Uh, I just need to edit it, edit it just a little bit and get it up there. Uh, so hopefully that'll be up uh, either today or tomorrow. Anyway, within the next few days, you'll have that uh, new episode. And also, I'm experimenting uh, with using Google Air Hangouts instead of uh, Skype for that. So what it means is that, in theory, uh, next time we do one, everybody uh, can either join in or at least watch as it's being uh, recorded live. Uh, so we're shooting for the first Friday of every month. Uh, so keep, you know, mark your calendars if you're inter interested in that. Uh, it'll be 5 o'clock p.m. Central Time, CST. So I know that can be kind of rough on some of you guys over in Poland or Yugoslavia or wherever uh, you match hatters happen to be. All right, what about that ale of the week? Well, this one's a, a sent in by a fan, uh, GoTrek44, a longtime fan, I do believe. Uh, I think he's been with me uh, from the very, maybe in that first episode, but anyway, long, long time. Uh, first time he sent me an ale, though, so <laughs> uh, maybe I'll start a trend. Uh, this is uh, GoTrek44, a.k.a. Jeff Yurkovich, and he says uh, he sent me uh, two gumball heads, three Floyds. Two gumball heads, three Floyds. <laughs> Sounds like it's uh, some kind of alien code word, right? Uh, but this is what it is. We've got gumball head beer. It's a wheat beer, one of my favorite styles. Uh, Three Floyds Brewing out of uh, Amarillo, no, Amarillo Hops. Uh, where are these guys out of? Um, hmm. Where are, oh, let's see. Brewed and bottled by Three Floyds Brewing in Munster, Indiana. <laughs> 
you know, I've been looking all over this bottle. I do not see the anything else about like the alcohol content. Uh, it's not normal. Some kind of psychedelic uh, artwork on this thing. You know, I'll show you the bottle uh, later. So red wheat and boatloads of Amarillo hops give this American wheat brew a lemony finish. Slight haze in the bottle is yeast added for bottle conditioning. <laughs> Yeah. Anyway, let's get this thing open and see if uh, GoTrek 44 is a friend or an enemy. <laughs> All right, so I got some of this two gumball heads, three Floyds here in the rather excellent drinking horn. I've been smelling it. You know, it doesn't smell at all uh, like what I'd expect from a wheat ale. Uh, instead, I'm smelling uh, something kind of like a pale ale. Maybe, maybe even an IPA. You definitely smell those hops in there. Uh, it's kind of a nutty-like aroma to it. Uh, let me go ahead and, and taste it, though. Uh, of course, I'll be toasting you. Uh, go Trek 44, a.k.a. Jeff Yurkovich. Uh, you definitely taste those hops in here. Again, not, not anything like I would have... You know, if it, if it didn't have the word wheat ale on the bottle, I would never have associated it with that. Instead, this is more of a pale ale bit of an IPA. You definitely taste the hops. A little bitterness there, just, just a little. Uh, a lot of different flavors. Uh, the lemon that they mentioned. A little bit of that uh, nutty sort of uh, flavor. Uh, let me try it again. Yeah, a lot of flavor. I'm really, you know, this is the kind of thing uh, that'd be perfect on a really hot summer day. You just got out of the pool and you, you're looking to relax with a couple of cold ones. I mean, this would really hit the spot. It's really, really tasty. Yeah, it's smooth. You know what I like about this one is the, the, the aroma, I mean, the, uh, the flavors are there, but they're not overwhelming. They definitely don't feel like you're, uh, <laughs> you know, a, a lost, a wash in a sea of strange uh, flavors or anything. On the other hand, it doesn't taste like a wheat ale. It's definitely more pale, pale ale uh, IPA territory here. So keep that in mind. If you're looking for the wheat taste, I'd go somewhere else. But if you're okay uh, with that kind of flavor, uh, you might like this. Uh, on the drinking horn scale, uh, you know, it's kind of hard to say. I don't know how I feel about calling it a wheat and not tasting like a wheat. Uh, so with that distinction in mind, I'll go ahead and give it the five out of five drinking horns. Uh, but just keep in mind, it's not uh, the ale to go to if you're looking for that traditional wheat experience. If you want something more of a pale ale IPA though, uh, this is one of the best. Uh, five out of five drinking horns for sure. So let's wrap this up with a quotation. And the quotation for this week comes from, of course, uh, Hugh Hefner, who was, I was actually surprised how many great quotes uh, this man has uttered over the years. I had to really think about uh, how to narrow this down, but I think my favorite is this. Life is too short to be living someone else's dream. See you guys next week. Don't the Bible have some pretty specific things to say about killing? Quite specific. It is, however, somewhat fuzzier on the subject of kneecaps.